I want to introduce three guests on this week's show. They're all friends of the show and they're all friends of mine. First, we have uh, a man who's been on dozens of times and Harold Shelton, BTN's manager of research. We also have BTN anchor and reporter Coley Harvey. We have BTN football analyst, former Ohio State football player, Joshua Perry. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Glad to be thanks here. for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, and Harold, Coley, and Joshua are, are three black men who have shared some incredibly impactful thoughts since I've gotten to know each of them. And it's been especially true throughout the past brutal week and a half we witnessed in this country following the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and one of our Big Ten cities. Um, usually, I have some sort of outline or, or list of questions to ask guests on the show, but this episode is going to be different. Um, there's no real framework I set for this discussion today. I don't plan on being much of a part of it at all, um, other than opening up the platform. But um, to get it started, I just want to set the stage so listeners know about our guests and what they've been, been saying. Um, on May 31st, Harold shared a 10 tweet thread that started with, and I quote, conversations I've had with my family and friends because I'm a black man. It was uh, retweeted and liked dozens of times on the platform and generated a, a pretty powerful response from colleagues and beyond. Coley released a really powerful post in early May following the killing of uh, Ahmaud Arbery about some of the discrimination Coley himself faced in high school in Georgia. He also has posted a couple of videos over the last week that have gotten widespread attention, one on May 29th, another on June 3rd, uh, sharing important thoughts about the ongoing atrocities uh, we've seen in America. The one on May 29th got 111,000 views, so that one really took off. And, and Joshua, I've admired him uh, since I met and started following him close to a year ago for his willingness to be outspoken, and genuine on, on social media and on the subjects of racial injustice and beyond. Uh, and that was you know, especially apparent this week when, when quite a few people needed to hear it. So uh, I know he's also gone on his radio show on 97.1 in Columbus to share his perspective as well. So let's use Harold's thread as a starting point for the discussion. I'll get out of the way there and just listen. Um, so H, when and how did you decide to collect those experiences, share them on Twitter, and I'm sure Coley and Joshua uh, read those and recognized them as shared experiences as well. Yeah, I think it was just kind of slowly building up. Um, obviously, George Floyd's murder, uh, you know, was set off a lot of emotions amongst a lot of Black people. Uh, it was just kind of another, another one in a long string of senseless murders. Um, by police that have happened. And, you know, you start to see the protests that have gone on throughout the week. You see people kind of sabotaging the protests or people, you know, putting more on the protests than the actual murders uh, that took place and, you know, kind of trying to reroute the conversation. And, you know, I was just getting so angry and so frustrated that, you know, I, I couldn't turn CNN off Saturday night. Um, and I just kind of tried to get my thoughts together and say, you know what, you know, I, I have to get this out. I have to get this anger and this rage out. And, you know, sometimes it might be uncomfortable, but you know what, I have to do it. Protests are supposed to be uncomfortable. Uh, I shouldn't have to suppress my emotions anymore. And so, you know, I'm literally like typing this out and my hands are shaking because I'm so angry, I'm so frustrated. And I send it out there, and just kind of got away from it. Um, and, you know, starting to, my phone's blowing up and I'm getting calls and texts and, you know, people that had no idea and wanted to reach out. And it's just, you know, a lot of times, you know, we all work together. We all are, you know, might root for the same team or known each other for so long, but you don't know what my experiences are like because we're different and just because you might see me as a great guy doesn't mean that the police would see me as the same and so that kind of you know led me to say what i had to say i'll let you jump in first josh yeah i, I can um i can definitely resonate with that and i i think kind of the the point that you made there is there comes a point where you watch something happen on a Monday and it's an atrocity. It was a cold blooded murder for nine minutes nearly. A police officer had his knee on someone's neck on camera with other police officers waiting. And then you go throughout the week and like you said, it's a slow build because now you're not, you know, you, you see the video and you see the initial reactions and then you're waiting for 
the police officer to be in custody and you're waiting to see what happens with the other officers. And all the while you get the, the folks on uh, mainstream media, which did a really good job, I think initially with some of the reporting and how they talked about it as a murder, because um, that was very clear. But you, you get on social media and you, you see some of the tweets and replies and responses. And um, then you start to see people looking for a reason to assassinate George Floyd's character and all these different things going on. And I think it just gets up to a point. And uh, the biggest thing about it to me is um, how we feel like even though there's clear evidence of wrongdoing, and there has been evidence for years and years and years, decades, centuries going back, um, we still have to explain ourselves and we still have to explain to other people how this is an injustice and why it's an injustice and, and how we need to change what we're doing. Um, and so the, the thing that I can appreciate is you sharing conversations about personal experiences, conversations about explanations you've had to make to other people um, because it's it's a continual thing. It's over and over. And, and, and this is this has happened. I hope that we see some true reform from it. Um, but the reality of the situation is we could go on and this could be another hashtag that we talk about with the new person and we'll start this cycle over again. Um, and that's the thing that I would hate to see happen, but we've seen it time and time again. You know, um, I guess a lot of my emphasis, impetus, I should say, for sharing my stories actually comes from this book right here. Uh, this is David Walker's Appeal. It was a book that uh, used to be one of the most dangerous books in America, was what it was called. It was written in 1829 by a man named David Walker, who was black in Boston. And uh, this was his appeal to, uh, to slaves, to freed black people, but also his appeal to white America to say, these are the reasons why we, uh, why we exist in this country and why, um, why our voices need to be heard and why we need to be free as a people. And this one passage has been sticking with me, it's very brief, but it's one passage has been sticking with me for the last couple of days and it just reaffirms some of the reasons why these stories need to be shared and why people need to hear uh, just what all three of us are talking about here. It goes, there is a great work for you to do as trifling as some of you may think of it. You have to prove to the Americans and the world that we are men and not brutes as we have been represented and by millions treated. And the reason why that resonates is because that's exactly what the officer in Minnesota was treating George Floyd as, was an animal. He, he, he acted as if this was not a human being. And unfortunately, as, as we've all been saying, these incidents have happened before. This is not the 100th time or the 1,000th time or possibly even the millionth time. And, um, you know, hopefully by sharing these stories, by connecting with people on a, on a deeper level, on a, on, a, on a more individual level, person to person level, I hope that that is going to begin some level of change, that maybe just that, that little seed is going to be what can kind of spark some of the change that we're all hoping for. You know, Something that I am curious with with you you both um, that we've we've discussed even privately amongst ourselves, and I've had these conversations with other black men who who are friends of mine and even people who are just kind of close to me, but you know that I might see in the street somewhere as I'm running an errand. Um, we've seen some really rough images uh, in this past week. Um, I was jolted uh, that Tuesday when I saw the full video. It took me a while myself before I actually sat down and said, okay, let me just see this. I've got to put my eyes on it just to be aware of it. Um, and then seeing uh, Omar Jimenez, you know, a Big Ten produced uh, 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 student himself and former student athlete at Northwestern who was arrested uh, for doing his job on live television. Um, because of what he looked like. Um, seeing those moments uh, gave me great pause. And I, I, I mentioned this because I'm curious to know for the two of you, Harold and Joshua, how have you all been able to process what we have seen this, these past, uh, this past week? How have you all been able to separate? Uh, because we need that mental separation to go somewhere to kind of get our minds off of, off of what we're repeatedly seeing day in and day out. How have you all been able to do that? I guess I'll just go with Harold uh, to begin that. Uh, <clears throat> my wife has said repeatedly to just turn off CNN for a little bit and just get away from it. 
you know, because I'm a guy who, when I, when I see something happening, I just kind of put myself all into it and I try to absorb as much as I can, whether it's through TV or social media or talking with people. Um, and I think for a while that just got really unhealthy and she just said, look, turn the TV off, just put your phone down and let's just get away from it. And so I've tried to have some distractions and try to, you know, just kind of get out and run and, and exercise and try to get away that way just to kind of, you know, protect my mental space because uh, it's been, it's been battered. It's been battered for the last 10 days and I'm just trying to find something uh, to take my mind off of what's happening, but I still feel like I keep going back to Twitter and going back to CNN when, you know, I do get done because it's still happening. Like whenever you turn it on, there's still more protesting. There's still more violence against protesters. There's more of uh, hijacking of protests, uh, hijacking of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, I kind of fall back into that same rut that I've been in. No, I um, I can definitely resonate with that, Harold. Um, and, and, and Coley, for me, the hardest thing is, I don't know if I've really been able to separate if I'm being truthful. Um, and, and it, you know, I have obligations day to day, obviously I have to work and I have to be uh, a fiance and I have to be a brother and a son and a friend to all these different people. But the reality of the situation is it's hard for me to put the cell phone down. It's so accessible now. Um, all the negativity and all the images and, um, you know, all the things that get you fired up. Um, and, and it's truly, uh, it's been exhausting. It like, that's the, the only word that I think really summarizes it. It's been exhausting to have your mind uh, not be able to shut off. You can't get a good night of rest. You know, you wake up and the first thing you want to do is, is look at Twitter to see what else is out there that you might have missed overnight. Um, and it's tough. And, and we experienced, just like uh, a lot of major American cities here in Columbus, Ohio, we experienced um, the protests and they got out of hand and we saw some of the violence from the police officers. Uh, we had a, a city council president, a county commissioner, and a congresswoman who got maced. Uh, during these protests on Saturday at 11 a.m. And those are the types of things that I can't let go of. When I see those images of upstanding members of our community, because everybody, you know, people try to, to tarnish the movement because they say some members of the movement are this and they're that. Um, but when you get the model citizen that everybody wants to look at, and that's still how they treat you, it's, that's where I can't separate. And so um, I've, I've tried everything. We've tried to put our phones down. Um, but the reality is, I feel like uh, my time is is partially better served in being a voice and, and, and really being out there sharing these messages. Um, but the reality of the situation, too, is like, I just can't bring myself to separate yet because I'm not at that point. How much sleep do you think you've been getting uh, lately, Joshua? I, you know, I wake up early. Um, I'm up at, at five in the morning lately, and I try to go to sleep around 10, but I'll wake up at least three or four times during the night. It's not, you know all the way through that I can sleep. I'm waking up and I'm, you know, literally sweating sometimes. Um, and I'll calm myself back down and get back to sleep. But it's just, it's been, um, it's, it's been very unnerving. It's, it's not something that sits very comfortably with me. Yeah, I, I have to uh, 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 agree with that sentiment. I mean, I, I've had my share of sleepless nights. I was actually just talking with a friend of mine who's also a, a journalist who's black, um, actually also in the city of Chicago here. And uh, he was mentioning the same thing that uh, he already kind of battles with insomnia to begin with, but he had a stretch last night where he couldn't fall asleep until almost three in the morning. And then he was up at five and couldn't get back to sleep. And the reason, because there is this incessant pressure, exhaustion is the best word, as you mentioned, anxiety in some sense, you know, I, I'm, I'm here, uh, I live in, in downtown Chicago and, um, you know, just along the streets, very close to where I'm at, so many stores have been looted uh, or were looted, I should say, uh, Saturday during the, the protests on Saturday that, the, I shouldn't say the protests, but the post-protests, the, the rioting and everything that took place afterward, that's when all that went down. Um, and it, that's alarming enough to have to look at and then realize, wait, where am I going to get groceries? Where am I going to get this? How am I going to do that? You know, I don't own a car right now. So, I mean, I, I've been living this city life. I don't need a car. So now I've got to figure out a way to get some other part of the city to get the things that I need. So you got to add that on top of the other stresses and pressures 
uh, that that we're dealing with. And you know, when when I ask the question of of what do we do to to, to kind of tune out, for me, it is riding my bike. It is going around the city. But yet, again, yeah, it's it's there. You know, um, the the days when I'm riding my bicycle and I see hordes of police officers. And even though I'm riding past thinking, okay, these guys have the best intentions in the world. They're not going to do anything to me. And they don't. There's still that unease because I've had those moments where I've been minding my own business, doing everything according to the letter of the law and still been pulled over or still been pulled out um, or still had a, an officer point his weapon at my forehead. Um, you know, that has happened. And, and as you mentioned, when you hear quote unquote, upstanding citizens in this society who've had to deal with these kinds of issues. I think that's when it really resonates and hits home for so many people. All of this being said, guys, I don't know about you all, you probably and may feel differently than I do, but there is some level of optimism that I still have had through all of this for whatever reason, I, I really can't explain it. I, I just feel like this particular moment in time is a little bit different than what we've seen in some of these recent cases and, and incidents that we've seen. I'm just curious to know, A, if you guys feel that way, and if you do, why is that? And if not, why, why is that? Um, I'll start with you, Harold. Uh, maybe slightly. Uh, I think there is uh, maybe slight optimism just because there seem to be so many people uh, that have you know, been aware. You know, it's become an international issue. It's not just you know, a regional situation. I mean, you've got Syria protesting Black Lives Matter. You've got Berlin. You've got New Zealand. I mean, it's literally over a dozen countries that, you know, are fighting for this movement. And I don't recall that at any point in my life, at least, uh, where it's, you know, gone to such uh, extremes. But at the same time, I feel like we've protested and we've, we've marched, we've asked, we've, you know, begged for know equal rights and you know we another hashtag happens because another senseless murder happens and i'm just cautious because i don't want all the momentum that we're starting to gain just kind of go away in the next couple of weeks as something else uh, occurs and people just kind of go back on with their lives i i feel like that's happened way too much and i'm worried that that'll just be the case again you know when july comes around are we still going to be you know this active yeah, my, my optimism definitely comes with that level of skepticism. And I'm, I'm optimistic for the same reasons. Um, this has become an international topic that people are talking about. And I think that uh, for a lot of Americans, we have so much pride. And now to feel like um, we're, we're the nation that other, team, or other uh, nations feel pity for um, is something that Americans don't take kindly to. And I, I feel like that should motivate a lot of people um, into action on this topic. Uh, we see a lot of folks who are seemingly um, embracing allyship right now, which is something I can definitely appreciate, but it also feels a lot like a trend to me. Um, you know, this Blackout Tuesday thing, every, everybody posted on their social media, but did you post because you truly believe in the cause and you truly, and, and I shouldn't say cause, right? Black lives aren't a cause. This is human That's rights. Right. Like, this is our, these are our lives. This is real but do you truly believe in the value of black lives or did you do it because everybody else was doing it and you want it to be on trend? Um, and I think that's a serious question that we should ask people because a lot of those postings came with um, inaction and a lot be before and after this is silence still from those same people. Um, and so it's not to necessarily be negative, uh, that's to, to motivate people and really ask them the question, are you committed uh, to what we're talking about here? Or are you only on it right now because it's a trendy thing to do. And so uh, my hope is that we can continue to find ways to create these allies and to keep people motivated uh, to be champions of our lives. But at the same time, I think there's so many things that go on in society that Harold's right. We could look not even in July, we could be you know a week from now and nobody's talking about it because that's how cyclical this thing is. Yeah. Um... One question I, I had for you guys, and, and actually, Josh, I'm, I'm going to come right back to you on this, because obviously we are part of the Big Ten Network, we're part of the Big Ten Conference, and uh, these questions are not just germane to society at large, but also to our individual schools and, and the teams and the, and, and the league that we cover. 
Um, as a student athlete, Joshua, um, what moments do you feel like you had while you were at Ohio State that came to defi define you as a black man uh, on campus and maybe things that have even resonated to you to this day that have helped define who, uh, who your, what your identity is? I think probably one of the biggest things that defined me is I've always been somebody who's outspoken on these different topics. Um, and, and a number of topics as I was a student athlete, obviously um, the plight of black people in, in the fight for equality is something that I've always been vocal about. But even as a student athlete, for example, um, to the point where we're at talking about name, image, and likeness, that was something I harped on. Um, you know, I, I, hated, I, I hated the thought of my coach making $6 million and some of my teammates could barely pay their rent because they had to send money home to help their families. Um, but a lot of these topics were met with the, they were met with the response, stick to football. And that to me was something, number one, um, that I felt really disrespected by because my status as an athlete doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm less academic than somebody else or I'm less qualified to speak on certain topics. And as a matter of fact, I think that my perspective as an athlete would make me more qualified to speak on certain topics than a lot of the voices that surround them. But the other thing it really became to me was uh, motivation. I wanted to be somebody who was going to uh, use their platform and buck the trend, even if it was going to be unpopular. Um, and that continued for me, even when I was in the NFL, we had 2016 with Colin Kaepernick, obviously uh, kneeling in protest. And when I was playing in San Diego, uh, there were a few teammates and we would stand with our fists in the air and our hand over our heart during the national anthem as a sign of solidarity. And that was very unpopular, especially in San Diego, uh, a city that has a high military uh, population Many people didn't like that. You know, we got the booze, but I felt like it was our obligation to, to use our platform and, and the eyes that were on us to be able to share our message. So um, I think that was defining. I would say overall as well, um, being a black person and specifically a black male at a predominantly white institution, um, it's always a little bit uneasy. And you look at some of the halls that exist on campus and they existed before the days that black people were allowed to go into them. So it's, it's a little bit daunting and intimidating, um, especially when you first get on campus to have to reconcile with that. And um, I know a lot of African-Americans are first generation when they walk onto these campuses too. So they don't have anybody necessarily to lean on to share about their experiences while they're in university. So um, for me, I, I always took all of those things and I wanted to become, again, somebody that was a, um, a trailblazer in terms of, of being a voice and, and being outspoken and, and using my platform for positive. Harold, I'm curious, uh, when you were in school, what, uh, w was there anything that helped define your, uh, your black manhood, so to speak? Uh, it's interesting. Um, I agree a lot with, with Joshua in terms of you know, being a, a black male on a predominantly you know, white campus. It definitely can be daunting. Um, I know at Michigan State, um, I stayed close to the, uh, the sports facilities. So I stayed by Spartan Stadium. I stayed by the Breslin Center because I knew I would be, uh, you know, a student ticket holder and I was gonna just want to walk back and forth uh, to those games. But um, so I made sure to stay kind of in that area, which was predominantly white. Um, all the way across campus was what we call the Black Dorm, um, which you know, had about 12 floors in it. And that's where most of the people I went to high school with were, who were predominantly black wound up staying. And so I know I wanted to kind of have a, a more diverse situation because I, you know, being from Detroit, I had predominantly black elementary, middle and high school. And, you know, I didn't want to necessarily just go right into the same thing. I wanted to at least have a, a little bit of diversity um, in my experience, but at the end of the day, I always knew where to find my people whenever I felt comfortable. It was just a shame I had to go all the way across campus to do it. But um, you know, for the most part, I just really agree with Joshua. It certainly could be daunting. It's a, it took a while for me to kind of find my footing. Um, and I'd say I probably had more issues driving to and from campus because there's a stretch on I-96 that is filled with uh, rural white towns and there's one in particular that um, is known for KKK uh, activity and so it's one of those situations where you better make sure you fill up before you leave 
because you do not want to stop uh, anywhere along those towns. You know, it's, it's interesting for me. I'm from Atlanta, so I, I grew up in the South, and obviously the South is like the poster child for, uh, uh, you know, racial disharmony, which in some, in many ways, obviously is true, especially because of the history, but in some ways also isn't true. Um, I, I had experiences growing up that were different than when I went to college at Northwestern. Um, I had never, I was lucky, but growing up in, in Atlanta, I had never been stopped by police when I was growing up. Uh, when I got to Chicago, uh, I was uh, stopped with a group of friends of mine. We were all black and Latino. Uh, within the first two weeks of me being in the city, um, I got stopped a couple of other times walking on campus, uh, ask, asking to asking for the police to see my campus ID because, you know, I'm wearing a hoodie and a big coat and maybe a do-rag or, or a hat or something. I don't look like I belong, uh, but I very much did. <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, just hearing, hearing what you just shared, Harold, just reminded me of that. And even what you said, Joshua, too, and, and finding some of those, uh, those avenues to have your voice heard or to just be seen on campus. You know, for me, um, I had actually started playing sports uh, at Northwestern. I started to walk on, on on the baseball team when I was there. So I, I was an athlete for a couple of months at least, but invariably that whole freshman year, constantly when somebody met me and saw me wearing a logo or or seeing me around campus, thought I was an athlete. And oh, unfortunately at this point, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm just a regular student. Um, I ended up joining a fraternity historically African-American fraternity on campus Phi Beta Sigma. And um, a lot of my impetus, my, my, my push to, to be part of that fraternity was to get recognition to all of our student groups, whether they were the black Greeks or just black student groups in general on campus. And we started this initiative uh, that I was proud of at the time called Bridging the Gap. And it started in the, in the Greek community. We brought people from all different walks of life together for conversations that had to be had. They were difficult conversations too. I mean, I, I remember sharing some of these stories about my experiences growing up because I may not have been stopped by police growing up, but I certainly had my share of experiences and other, and other factors and other aspects. Um, I remember sharing some of that with, with some of my colleagues then, my peers then, and they just couldn't believe it. You know, they were astounded. Um, and I just share that story to say that that was part of my feeling like, okay, I, I belong here. Um, part of my reason for standing up as well is because sort of like you, Harold, I, I grew up in that situation where I, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood, basically an all black neighborhood. Um, people of all parts of the economic stratus uh, in that area. Um, and then I get to uh, high school and I went to a school that was basically all white, predominantly white and primarily at an upper tier of the economic stratus. And it was certainly a little bit of a shock, but it helped prepare me for Northwestern. And, um, and I just share that to say that it was important to me when I got to campus, to college, that I let people know who I was, where I came from, why my voice mattered, why the situations that I went through mattered and how they compared to some of the situations that some of those other students um, maybe had gone through in their lives. And so, I don't know. I just, I just, I just felt that um, I just felt that that was part of my place was to have my my strong black identity and to figure out a way to merge who I was uh, with with other students. And and again, that's a lot of what we we are un unfortunately having to do even today. You know, I mean, that was going on almost 15 years ago, and now we're still having the conversations that my peers and I were really trying to push forward um, even at that time. I, you know, uh, something else I wanted to kind of, as, as we keep the conversation going here, something else I wanted to ask about, and, and you kind of touched on your time in the NFL, Joshua. Of course, this week, as we're talking right now, the big saga with Drew Brees um, coming out and, and, and saying uh, that he is not in favor of disrespecting the anthem and essentially equating uh, Colin Kaepernick's protests to disrespect of the anthem. Of course, Drew is one of our uh, valued alum uh, here in the Big Ten, so we can't ignore this this conversation. Given what was said in the initial interview, his apology and response since then, 
what will that locker room be like as a, as a player who's been in the NFL and was around during Kaepernick's protest? What, what will that locker room look like? And just what are some of the things that, that you think Drew is going to have to do to, to truly win some of his teammates back, Joshua? Yeah, I, I think it's important that um, we kind of address what was said so people can understand why, um, you know, players in that locker room would be upset about it. And what basically what he said is that he would never agree with anybody disrespecting the flag or the anthem. And that feels a lot like a line that comes from um, one of those opinion news programs and not like a line that would come straight from the mouth of one of his teammates. And he's had four years to hear all the stories. And it's not that he needs to necessarily agree with it, but a statement of, I, I am not personally someone who would kneel, but I would support my teammates if they did, would be something more in line after four years of hearing what these guys are talking about. So I think we have to start there and understanding. And then the apology um, to me, and not again, like, I don't know Drew Brees very well. I've heard that he's wonderful. He's done a lot of charitable things. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the reality of the situation is the apology um, was essentially, I'm sorry for how you guys interpreted what I said. Um, and and I, I just feel like that's, that's not really an apology. It's either, you know, I'm sorry for what I said or you just, you, you saved the apology. Um, and so I, I think he's going to have to answer questions about both the statement to his teammates and then the apology. Um, but one of the things about the NFL is these things tend to get solved quickly because all of those guys are together for a common goal, and that's to compete for a championship. And I think Drew Brees has probably done enough within his locker room to prove that he's an outstanding teammate. He's done enough within the community for sure to prove that he cares about people, uh, specifically people that live in New Orleans. Um, a lot of them are African-American folks, so I think we can rely on his past to help bolster that and, and maybe accelerate the process of him earning his teammates trust back. And I'm sure um, as, as wise as he is and as much money as he has, he'll probably dedicate some of his time and funds to supporting um, causes that are associated with Black Lives Matter, uh, which would be important. But the reality of the situation is I think um, the, the statement itself was troublesome because it felt like he was still ignoring some of the voices of his teammates. And I think he's gonna have to address those questions. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, and, and Drew is someone who I've interviewed myself. I've talked to him uh, on occasion once or twice. And I, I just my personal take on that when I when I saw the word, when I saw the interview, heard the words, I knew where he was trying to come from. But unfortunately, he his, his message got lost because he was kind of false, not false, but yeah, he was he's falsely equating uh, one thing to, to something else. Um, that being said, as you mentioned, he has uh, tons of respect as far as what he has done in the past, charitably, uh, charitably and otherwise within uh, New Orleans and the state of Louisiana that, um, that I'm interested to see what, how he progresses in that sense. One thing also that I think about, I, I covered the NFL for, uh, for about three years earlier in my career. And I remember being in uh, a locker room one day during the height of the presidential election. This would have been the year, the season before Kaepernick began his protest. And, um, you know, I remember hearing teammates uh, just going at each other uh, about a political issue, about their support of a particular candidate. And I mean, it was very, very bad and loud and rough. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, oh, we got practice and it diffuses. You go out, you focus on the goal at hand, you put that behind you. And then, of course, you come back and you may talk about it uh, later. But, uh, but the fact of the matter is there is a common goal that a team has to have. And those conversations, to your point, are going to be had um, to, uh, to make sure that they're on the same page by the time the season starts. Uh, Harold, I want to pick up with you um, the question about what those of us in Big Ten country can do to maybe um, to, to maybe be, not just be an ally, but be the kind of voice that has been sorely missing and sorely lacking uh, when it comes to these past uh, incidents that we've had that have been part of this larger issue. What do you think that people within the confines of, of the, the locales in our, in our conference, what can they do to, uh, to perhaps uh, help things along here? Uh, I think a lot of it just starts with listening. Um, I think a lot of it also means that people need to be uncomfortable. 
I mean, having conversations that are uncomfortable are ways where people can get to know each other and get to know real issues that are happening. Um, you know, it's really easy to, you know, go to the bar and sit down and talk about, you know, your favorite team or your kids or whatever, but, you know, no one's really asked me, you know, how have you dealt with racism? It's a question that doesn't happen. Um, and I don't know if it's because a lot of those, a lot of friends of mine might not be racist, but might know some racist people. There might be some people who have some old school views uh, that, and they might say, hey, well, I'm not racist. It doesn't matter to me. But at this point, that can't be the answer. You have to be anti-racism. You can't just say I'm a racist. I'm not a racist and leave it at that. And so I think more people need to kind of check their privilege at the door. I think more people just need to own up to, you know what? I was, I was willfully obtuse. I was wrong. I was completely ignorant. I was completely blinded. I had no idea what was going on and start having these conversations and start doing the research of what more can I do to be better? You know, I mean, there's literally every day someone's posting articles about, you know, ways white allies can, you know, help with the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, at this point, you can certainly find stuff, you know, whether it's on Twitter, whether if you just Google it, I mean, there's stuff popping up all over the place. Um, I think, you know, that's certainly one way to go. Uh, I think we need to mention that the University of Minnesota decided to not mm -hmm. use the Minneapolis the Police Department anymore for their events. And I think that is really powerful. And they didn't wait, you know, weeks. This came out a couple of days after days we saw later. what happened. And so, you know, I think the fact that they were able to do that and then the Minneapolis Public School District did the same thing. And so I think affecting the bottom dollar is a way to also promote change. And so I was uh, very happy to see that. Um, but, you know, that's just one thing. I still remember, um, you know, Wisconsin had a racial issue where, you know, people brought an Obama uh, dial that had a noose on it. And that was three or four years ago. So, I mean, you know, lynching is nothing you should ever, ever joke about. And the fact that people were willing to do that with the president of the United States just shows how far we still have to go. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned something about uh, the, the, the people who've been allies who've been trying to step up. Uh, I'm curious for both of you, have you had people who have called you out of the blue, texted you out of the blue, uh, asking, are you okay? How are you doing? I mean, I, I know that's been happening to me a lot the last few days. And uh, I, I'm curious how you both have handled that, what you think of that. Um, I'll start with you first, Harold, and then I'll, I'll ask you, Josh. Yeah, I, there were a few who reached out um, kind of as everything was going on, as the buildup was happening. Um, I want to say after Sunday, I certainly uh, got a lot of, of phone calls, text messages, you know, people replying to tweets, you know, showing their support um, and all of that I'm, I'm certainly grateful for. Um, I'm, I've always just wondered, you know, kind of like, why now? You know, like th this has been an issue for, you know, as Joshua mentioned, you know, years, decades, centuries, you know, what is it that now, you, you know, the, the light bulb went off and said, you know what, this is wrong. Like it, it's been wrong from, you know, Eric Gardner, you know, it's been wrong for Tamir Rice. It's, it's been wrong for a while. And so, you know, I'm certainly glad that the light bulb is on, but I'm just wondering why now? Like, and will, and will you still care, you know, two weeks from now? You know, it's, again, I'm glad you checked in on me. I appreciate you checking in on me, but you need to continue to do that and continue to do that to your other Black friends who you deem that you care about because we're all hurting and this isn't going to go away. And so I don't need you to just do a quick pop in. Hi, how you doing? Okay. You're good. Okay. I'm gonna go back to my life. Like if you want to be an ally, you need to fully be involved. No, I, I agree with that 100%. And I think those are a couple of legitimate questions to ask about it. And for me, um, I, I grew up a lot around a lot of white people. I grew up in the suburbs. I went to predominantly white schools my whole life. Um, and, and I live back in the same suburb where I grew up. And so I'm around a lot of the same people. I've seen these same faces. I do business with these people day to day. Um, so I've had a number of those folks reach out to me. Um, and, you know, they'll ask me, hey, how are you doing? 
you know, what can I do to help? And, and the answer is I'm exhausted, but I'm managing. And, you know, the, the answer to the second question, what can I do to help is first off, I challenge them is your care for me or is your care for black people? Because we talked about it earlier, you know, these model citizens and that's what people, you know, they, they, that's what they want us to be. But, you know, if I lived in a different part of the city, I didn't speak the King's English and I dressed differently, would you still respect me and care about me the same way? And that's a legitimate question that we have to ask because a lot of the times you don't know somebody, um, you're, you're definitely not gonna care for them, but do you respect them still? Um, and I, I like to challenge people with that. And then the other challenge I have for people too, is uh, one way that you can really help yourself in this because once you learn the power of our history, it will help you is to learn the history. And I think that America as a country has had a really hard time reconciling with the racist part of our history. And we, we leave the statues up, we fly the Confederate flags, but do we really talk about it enough? You know, not to bring this back up, but Drew Brees shared the story about his grandfathers that fought in World War II. And the reality of the situation is my dad's stepfather fought in World War II and he came back to America and he was not treated very well. Couldn't get his GI benefits, couldn't get a house, couldn't get his education, was sprayed down the streets, chased by dogs, the whole deal. We don't talk enough about that. We don't talk enough about how hard it was for families to get into certain schools, for families to buy homes, for families to ensure their homes, their businesses and their lives, and then wonder why there's such a disparity that exists right now. And so I think once we can reconcile with how America has treated black people previously, we can understand number one, how we're at this point, but then number two, what are some of the corrective steps we can take? Um, and, and so those are my two challenges. Number one is, is do you care about me or do you care about everybody? And then number two, how willing are you to invest yourself into learning about some of the history so the context now makes sense? And it's not just, you know, you're complaining about slavery, which was however many years ago, and you're complaining about Jim Crow, which only ended about 55 years ago. You know, people will start to understand how those have true lingering effects on um, our race relations today, on people's socioeconomic status today, on education today, um, and how all of that's really intersectional. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up real quick on, on Joshua's point. Sorry about that, Coley. Um, to your point, you know, a few days ago it was like the 99 year anniversary of the, the Tulsa massacre. And there was a thread on Twitter, I believe Jay Adande made a comment on it. It was how many people knew about the Tulsa race massacre or how many people were they uh, learned about it in school? 96% of people said no. People who grew up in Oklahoma and Tulsa had never heard about it until they watched The Watchmen. Yep. It wasn't until earlier this year that the Oklahoma school board decided to teach that in schools. Yep. So the stuff that's being taught is only, it's, you get the MLK stuff, yada, yada, yada. But we need more. We need to have more Black history stuff, not just have it be in one particular month. Like the school books need to change, the way that the information is processed needs to, needs to change. And so, you know, I, I completely agree with Joshua. Like you, you, the racist history needs to be televised, needs to be published. You, you're both saying the same things I was gonna say. Truth and reconciliation is one. And two, I, I think that particularly when it comes to black people, um, one thing that we can do for ourselves in this moment is to uh, boost up our history, to, to showcase our history. Um, yes, the, 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 the riot portion is what so many people want to talk about with Tulsa, but the reason why the riot happened is because Black Wall Street existed, yep. was because there was so much financial wealth and success among Black people in that neighborhood, in that community, in that city. And I get my broader point right here is that I want to make sure that Black people in, the, in this moment feel proud of themselves, feel proud of who they are. And this is not to denigrate anybody else. This is just a moment to, to reclaim and to, to proudly claim who you are. You know, um, one of the things for my family that, that we've been doing lately, and honestly, it's been a stroke of luck in all of these cases, but we've, my, my parents have been kind of the, the primary ones in my family doing this, but we're looking up our family history. Uh, something that I know a lot of non-Black people don't really know about Black folks is that it's so hard for us to go back 
certain generational points in our in our family histories because of slavery, because mm-hmm. families were ripped apart and um, a mother was taken from their babies and and you know and, and we end up in, in all these disparate places that that aren't where we began. So in my family, um, you know, we could only go to a certain generational point. Lately, we've been able to start going further and further and further back and even connecting some of the non-Black people who were part of my family from years ago. We were able to even start to connect that. But one story that my dad stumbled upon, and the only reason why he stumbled upon it was because of a journalist who happened to be sent, a journalist from St. Louis, who just happened to be sent to the South, um, basically to tell stories about what life was like in post-Reconstruction America. So this was like around 1896, somewhere in there. And this reporter is standing with a man in in this town, Hawkinsville, Georgia, which is one of the places that part of my family is from. And this man is just describing people in the town that are walking by. And he says, take this guy, for instance. And he's pointing out a man who happens to be my great, great, great grandfather. I think I had the right number of greats right there. Um, But Dempsey Clark, this was a man who he and his brother were actually slaves. They were on the auction block. And when they heard of where they were being sold to, which person, which slave owner they were going to, a man whose last name was Coley, they said, no, we're not going to Mr. Coley. Mr. Coley was known as being a brutal, harsh, uh, terrifying slave owner in the state of Georgia at that time. And so they said, nope, we'll go slave for anybody. We're not going with Mr. Coley. The uh, overseers and whatnot, they were taking them from the auction block, didn't want to believe it. Well, they get in the woods uh, as they're on their way to the plantation. My great, 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 my great, great, great grandfather and his brother, they escape. They get away. They hide out for three years in the woods. They knew how to live off the land. I mean, and, and in that area, that's, you're just starting to get into some of the swampier areas of Georgia. You're just leaving the hills. You're in truly forest. They lived there for three years before word finally got to them that Mr. Coley had said, you know what, I'm not going to, you know, I will let someone else have them. By that point, we're also getting near the end of the Civil War. So that that had an impact as well. But they came out of the woods just because they were told that they were going to go somewhere else. But the reason I tell that story is because that gives a level of pride to know what people in your family endured and what they went through to get themselves to a certain point. And the reason why the person was telling the newspaper reporter that story is because at that time, Dempsey Clark was doing very well for himself. He was one of the wealthier uh, blacks in that town at that time. And that was his point of connecting that story. And so, so so the reason this is coming to me right now is that in this moment, when things look so bleak and uh, and, and we're trying to, to tell people our history at the same time as Black people. I think it's incumbent upon us to find out more about our personal histories and to share that with ourselves. If we're, we don't have to necessarily share it to other people, but we need to share it with ourselves so that we feel this sense of worth that at times we may not be feeling right now. Um, I'm sorry I got a little long-winded right there, but it just felt like it was something that, that was on my mind and, and heart to say. Um, before we start to kind of close this down, one, one thing uh, that I would be remiss to point out and really want to make sure I hammer home is that, uh, you know, firstly, I got to say that the Big Ten Conference has an amazing commissioner. I am so thankful uh, for Kevin Warren being in the position that he's in right now and the words that he expressed uh, the other day when he released the statement. And uh, I just want to read part of that statement to our viewers and listeners uh, in case you missed them. But the part that really struck me was he said, as a black man, I pray every day for the health and safety of my wife and children, especially during interactions with law enforcement. We continue to see inequality and deep divide regarding how members of the black community are treated compared to the rest of society. And too often the results have been horrific and senseless. Such racism and inequality are pervasive, not just endemic in law enforcement. Meaningful change will only occur if as a nation, we are united, resilient and determined to create difficult, uncomfortable dialogue and take significant tangible action. We all need to strive to make the world a better place, one person, one family, one city, one state, one conference, one country. George Floyd's death cannot be in vain. On top of that statement, uh, he announced the formation of the Big Ten Conference Anti-Hate and Anti-Racism 
coalition that will extend to athletes, uh, coaches, presidents, uh, athletic directors as well. For you, Joshua, when you hear both the statement, but also uh, hear the news of the coalition being formed, uh, how do you feel about that? I, 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 it, it, it really makes me excited. Um, and I think this is the importance of um, black leadership. And there are plenty of competent um, African-American folks that could be in leadership positions that may be overlooked. But um, when you see, uh, when you have somebody that looks like you who can be a champion for your voice and for all the things that you believe in, I think it's important uh, to recognize. And having a coalition like that is obviously very important. And in the Big Ten Conference, is very diverse um, from big cities like Chicago and, and Columbus, Ohio is a bigger city to um, you know, places like Happy Valley um, that are a little bit more isolated. You, you get all kinds of people from different walks of life. And I think the ability to um, coach the administrators and coach the coaches, um, but also to affect the student athletes and let them know that they have a support system is big. Um, I think just overall for the conference to taking a lead like that um, is very important because I've said it before, but um, sports fans are really finicky. And, you know, they'll, they'll cheer for people when they're, when they're dunking the basketball and when they're scoring touchdowns. But, um, you know, when the cheering stops after that three hours, how much do they really care and support the people that they were just cheering for? So I think this kind of reinforces that thinking that um, we're dealing with people within the sports and we're dealing with people within administration and all those different things. And um, having resources is key. Uh, Harold, what about you? Yeah, I, I was ecstatic uh, when I read the statement. Um, it wasn't, you know, just a, a blanket statement that a lot of companies and teams have put out. You know, he he specifically made it personal. Um, he mentioned, you know, law enforcement um, and the many issues that Black people have with that. Um, he said that he was going to donate $100,000 from his foundation to the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Uh, which focuses on racism, hate, and voter registration and the issues uh, with that. So in addition to just forming a coalition, he's also you know, sending money to try to help with these issues um, on a broader scale. Um, and the, the police enforcement thing, I think, is really interesting. And it's kind of been the elephant in the room as to why all of this um, has happened in the first place. And it's not just, you know, George Floyd. Um, we've seen protesters that have been, you know, shot with rubber bullets, tear gassed, just for protesting for Black Lives Matter. And so, you know, I think it was, it was really interesting. I don't know if you guys follow uh, Tom Haberstro. He is, uh, he writes for NBC Sports and used to write for ESPN before this. And so he did a study on the NBA statements that came out um, of the 30 teams that it made, a, of the 30 teams in the NBA, 28 made a statement. Um, only, there was five, nearly 5,500 5, words and police was mentioned five times. Wow. Police brutality mentioned twice. Wow. Wow. And so this is the issue. And I don't understand why, you know, bad police enforcement, why, why teams are dancing around this so much, why companies are dancing around this so much. So like when I see something like that, uh, it, it's really, really eye-opening to me. And um, just, a, just a quick, uh, you know, I'm a stats guy, so I had to <laughs> bring some stats into this. But, uh, you know, I was doing a little research myself, and I came across a uh, 2016 study called The Racial Confidence Gap in Police Performance, uh, which was done by the Pew Research Center. And so at least 70% of white people uh, think that officers do a good job when it comes to holding officers accountable treating racial ethnic groups equally, using the right amount of force for each situation and protecting people from crime. Again, this was done in 2016. Black people were under 36% in three of those categories and under 50% in all four. So what that said, it would be nice, and I go back to this, my earlier point, white people need to listen to what our issues are. And I feel like that has been an overlying thing where you bring up something that's like, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. This is my experience. This is what I'm telling you. This is what happens. And even on a thread that was retweeted from you know, a colleague of mine, at the very end, I see someone uh, reply, oh, a bit dramatic. These are my experiences, but you're not willing to listen 
to my experiences, to other black people's experiences. And so the fact that people aren't listening and the fact that police brutality is not being mentioned in these statements are two things that are really, really frustrating to me. And I was really glad that Commissioner Warren mentioned those things in his statement. Yeah. Um, guys, I know we, we maybe have gone a little bit over <laughs> the time that we initially had planned for, but this is a great conversation, one that needs to continue, obviously, uh, not just with us, as we've mentioned, it needs to continue a lot more broadly. Um, before we go, uh, any, any parting words, parting thoughts, Joshua? Yeah, um, parting thoughts. I, I think that um, I agree with what you said, where uh, as a culture, Black folks need to be champions of ourselves and we need to realize our history and how rich it is and all the beautiful things that go on. Um, but in saying that, that I, I don't think it's necessarily our burden to educate everyone else and it should be um, paramount for others, especially in the midst of this particular moment, um, to, to really learn and understand why all this is going on. But um, at the end of the day, I always try to, um, I try to be positive and I try to think that the world that my parents were brought into and the world that I live in are vastly different, and they are. There are still some things that I would like to change. And so for me, I want to be a difference maker within my community so my children can live in a different world than what I live in right now. And I would challenge other people to find ways to be difference makers, whether it's through financial resources that you have, whether it's through time that you have, whether it's through social capital that you have, you have to become a difference maker because it's that important. What about you, Harold? I just don't want this to be something where we have to go down the line and have this conversation all over again. You know, I really want the people, the white people who say they're allies to fully help us in creating change. I don't want this to just be lip service. I don't want this to just be a trend. I want you to stand with us, and make sure we get tangible change. Uh, there was a video that I saw over the weekend where it was a 45 year old black man and he was extremely frustrated and he was yelling at a 31 year old black man who was also extremely frustrated and they both were frustrated about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the 31 year old pulls the 16 year old over and he's frustrated and said, look, hopefully you guys will be able to create change because we're both angry and what we're doing isn't working. There's gotta be another way. And so I'm hoping that we can find another way. You know, that clip reminded me of uh, one of my uh, literary hero heroes, James Baldwin. You know, he gave an interview in the mid 80s when he was about 60 years old. And he said, you know, um, I've been, uh, you know, we've been waiting on progress for, you know, during my mom's time, my dad's time, my brother's time, my sister's time, my uncle's time, my aunt's time, my grandparents time, my time. How long do you want me to wait for progress? You know, and he did, he said for your progress, you know, which was an actually in a different and more emphatic uh, emphasis right there. But um, that video reminded me of that, that a lot of people are tired of being sick and tired. I think the three of us are among that, uh, but the three of us are also hopeful that those within our generation and those behind us, particularly some of the student athletes that we've seen, whether it's uh, student athletes speaking out at Florida State, which obviously is not this conference, but at Florida State or students within our conference who have begun speaking out or messages like Ohio State uh, put out in a couple of days, uh, Ohio State football put out in a couple of days after George Floyd's mur murder. Um, this is showing us that a more uh, hopeful and peaceful future really is possible and attainable. Um, so that's part of my parting thought is that we're going to get there. Some of what will get there, what will, what will get us there will be changes in legislation, changes in police reform, changes in the voting rolls. You know, people are going to have to uh, sit down and legitimately think of what they want in their leadership. Um, and I'm not advocating or talking about any specific position. I am just saying in general, from a local, state, and federal level, sit down, think long and hard, consider the options that you have when you go vote, and most importantly, go vote and let your voice be heard. And that's not just for black people, that's not just for white people, that is for everybody in this country because it is among the most basic uh, rights that we have in addition to the right to free speech and to say 
uh, and feel exactly what we uh, what we think and what we feel. And to that end, I want to say thank you to you three for or to you two for being here. Thank you also to Alex for setting this up and for coordinating this, and for the Big Ten Conference for even giving us uh, Big Ten Network, I should say, for giving us this platform, this opportunity to talk about these issues. Um, because these conversations must continue. And I hope that some of, some of you learn from this, hope you take something from it, and I hope, again, that you keep this dialogue going. Thank you very much for the time, everybody.